So today I have with me Dr. Robert Wolf, and you wrote a book that's called Not a Real Enemy, The True Story of a Hungarian Jewish Man's Fight for Freedom. And it's got some other Holocaust survivor true stories in it. So Dr. Wolf, I'd like to briefly get into some of your background and some, uh, you know, why did you write the book? And I'm going, I want to talk about anti-Semitism and the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States, because it's a huge problem, as you already know. And uh, it's, uh, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it, to be quite honest with you. I, I know a few people in my life, and I live in the middle of the country. I have a few people in my life that have said anti-Semitic things in my presence. And it's just like, what, where did you hear that stuff? Where, what makes you, wh why do you say these type of things? And so then I wanted to talk to some, some of my Jewish friends and, and kind of give them an idea why we don't say these things or, you know, and I'm sure you already know in, in, in my opinion, the only way to fight bad ideas is with good ones. So that's why you're here today. I want to talk a little bit about your background, why you wrote the book, and then we'll get into all the rest. Well, such a great question. I mean, the, the answer to that question, some of it you answered already, and some of it uh, would be like an hour long discussion. So uh, I'll try to uh, make this, uh, I'll try to keep my answers short, but cut me off anytime if they're not, because many times I just kind of I, I go on. But first of all, thanks for having me on. Pleasure meeting you, Ricky. Uh, a Steely Dan song. Ricky, don't lose that number. Great song. Uh, that is congrats, a great song. Congrats on your Chiefs and your Royals. Uh, I still got my Lions and my Tigers alive. And so partly the orange is for my Tigers, even though they're off today. And the fact that uh, my the book cover, Not a Real Enemy, is uh, we'll talk about the book cover in a minute, too, is uh, is based on an orange orange background, based on the Hungarian flag's colors. And your um, your icon on Podmatch is also a nice uh, orange, so I figured I'd go with orange today. So it goes good with uh, your black too, especially Halloween month coming up with Halloween coming up. So that's right. Uh, Anti-Semitism is the answer. That's why I did this project. I mean, my parents wrote this story, my dad's autobiography in the seventies. Uh, they wrote the stories as though they'd happened the previous day. Uh, it's an adventure. It's my dad's biography. It's a book about Hungary covering. World War I, all the way to the end of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, which not a lot of people know about. Uh, we can talk about the details there, too. Uh, Anti-Semitism in the background throughout the book. Uh, they, My mom and dad uh, did paper and pencil to a typewriter to a computer in the 70s and uh, wrote, like I said, they wrote the stories as though they'd happened uh, the previous day. The uh, sights, the sounds, the smells, the fear, the descriptions of all of that. Uh, were so poignant and so uh, accurate. My parents were very sharp people that uh, it was hard to to read and not and not, and put down. You, it was you couldn't put it down. That was for one. So finally, um, I read the book once as a manuscript. Uh, finally, a typed manuscript, probably when I was thirty, maybe. Uh, but I was busy. You know, I, I had a family and and career. I'm a radiologist. I, I'm still practicing as a radiologist now, uh, and uh, part time. But uh, flash forward to 1997, my dad passed away, unfortunately, 2016, my mom passed away, a historian friend of mine in uh, Michigan, uh, uh, we're from the heartland too, like you, we love our Midwestern people, hands me the disc and says to me, uh, uh, you got to read this. And, and I didn't think much of it at the time. I was so busy with my mom's affairs. And that was about a year. And then I retired for a year. And now we're at 2018. And my, a friend of mine from an old partner, a lesson there is never burn bridges uh, when you leave a job or or whatever it is. Uh, an old partner asked me to work part time from from home that they needed help. They were short. So I'm still doing that job part time from home uh, out of Michigan, even though I'm in Florida now. Um, but uh, I but that brought me to the book. Uh, it brought me to the disc. So uh, 2018, I start reading uh, x-rays and ultrasounds. And the way we have it set up on the left left screen is the patient queue, and on the right screen are the patient images. So what I did on the left screen was my dad's autobiography. On the right screen, I literally converted it to a biography, just pretty much uh, single, you know, I to we, I to he, uh, us to we, that kind of thing. Tried to query agents and and publishers, uh, kind of failed at that. Uh, we're ready to, I was ready to uh, self publish, but. Uh, I had a couple of beta readers pick up the, the book and, and read it, and they thought it was good. And one had my co-author in mind, Janice Harper, who took another year, redid the book, 
um, did a wonderful job. I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for her. Uh, she's a professional writer. She's a professional book coach. She's out in the Washington area. Uh, also a Michigan connection like me, which is really cool and really made the book something special. Um, conversations, letters to and from home, parallel stories, converging stories, much more personal than just uh, a third party biography. So uh, 20 edits later, many years of patience and uh, we look and then we vetted out uh, publishers and we get and picked up Amsterdam publishers uh, and that's all they do is Holocaust and Holocaust related uh, although there's a wide gamut there because uh, some of its uh, psychology of it some of its PTSD music in our case it covers communist Hungary as well as as well as uh, Nazi Hungary um, other people have used music and and singing and arts as part of their stories, as part of their books, many, many good books coming out of that publishing company, Amsterdam Publishers. So lucky us. So bottom of the ninth, shoestring catch, we get Amsterdam Publishers. And uh, it was about the same time that I went to Israel, which is about a year before the attacks, uh, never felt safer. And then the book's been out and I'm still working hard uh, promoting the book, of course, but also fighting anti-Semitism. And that's that's my basic. My parents wrote this book as though they knew I was going to do this. And if you knew me six years ago when I started You'd say this guy would never talk about anti-Semitism, right? And my mom and dad were big Holocaust educators and, and history educators, too. So uh, I guess I got the bug. I got the zap. Uh, the disc called out to me. We'll say like a, a Superman's kryptonite. It's kind of a corny analogy, but that's what I think. It just it summoned me like uh, and here we are. Um, the stories were so amazing. Dad had four escapes, multiple miracles. Cat has nine lives. Dad had 20. And uh, I couldn't let that I couldn't let those stories sit on a computer, on a screen or in a disc. So I decided to share it with the world. And here we are. And uh, those stories are so my dad's resilience, big message there, integrity, determination. Uh, we can go on and on and uh, we can pick one part. Uh, humiliation, hope. There's just so many, so many themes, so many and uh, all about anti-Semitism, even to the end of the story, end of the book. People that helped them escape in my dad's final and fourth escape still uh, talk about anti-Semitic anti slurs. And uh, I've heard them, too, growing up, and they're they're a little disturbing. Sometimes I Yeah, the Anti-Defamation League had recorded 10,000, uh, over 10,000 instances of anti-Semitism this year. That's unbelievable. Well, that doesn't include, you know, private conversations and right, right. And who knows who's in here with the immigration issues and who, who knows what's what's coming up. Uh, very scary. Every day is a gift. You know, I say that all the time. Uh, being in medicine, you know, we value hu the human tissue, the human, the human and not just humans, pets, animals, the beauty of the human body, the cell, the anatomy. Uh, that's that's what I that's why I fell in love with medicine, all the anatomy, especially. But all of that and people like Hamas and, and other they'll they'll destroy it in a minute. They'll they don't think they they don't respect human life and, and it's really sad. So uh here we are. Yeah, I mean, six years ago, I didn't even know there was a problem, Doc. I, I really didn't. I six didn't years either, ago. Yeah, yeah uh, my I book was... covers, yeah. No, no. At 20, 60, we're talking about 60, 80 years ago. And who'd think that in less than a hundred years we'd be tackling the same crap? I mean, and similar to 30s, uh, you know, I, I agree. And maybe it wasn't a problem, but it's it's sad when this uh, fuel gets ignited because of these October 7th uh, attacks, which we just had the anniversary, which uh, I posted as sad, but uh, uh, in a way, you know, I mean, it's it, it's so sad. I mean, that's, I can't describe it. Anymore. It's somber. It, it's it's disgusting. Uh, when you say, when you, if I hear a slur, I guess I can live with it because it's better than somebody coming at me with a knife or a gun or imprisoning me and torturing me, I mean, which is still going on, hard to believe. So uh, if we have to choose between being dead and pitied and being alive with a bad image, we'd rather be alive than have the bad image. Boy, and have quoted, the bad. that Golda Meir said that. I mean, you just paraphrased Golda Meir, and I've recently posted that. Uh, that's a that's a post that's been going around with the picture of her. There's a few of them with her because she was very, very tough leader of Israel, as you probably, as you know, you know, the Yom Kippur War. And of course, they had the Six Day War and countless other terrorist attacks going back to Yasser Arafat. Uh, we can go back to the Old Testament if you want, if you really want to make the argument about these battles. And and we'll throw the Christianity in too, because, you know, we had the, uh, in the mid, we had the Spanish Inquisition back in the day. And uh, it's sad how humans can't tolerate each other's uh, religions and races and way of life. I'm the opposite. I, I'm one of three Jews that grew up in a high school that was 40% African-American. I'm from suburban Detroit. So, 
but there was no anti-Semitism. We got picked on in, of course, seventh grade and ninth grade just because we were small, ignorant, and got caught in the, lo- the wrong hallway without anybody around, that kind of thing. Just, uh, But as we got older and more respected, it, it wasn't like that. Nobody, uh, any kind of slur that we would have, and we had we had fun with it. We left it on the field. You know, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't taken with us. We weren't uh, protesting and we weren't, uh, uh, I mean, and we had just missed the um, the riots, uh, the race riots back in, in Michigan and Detroit uh, back from the 60s and 70s. So we kind of missed the, the tail end of that. Uh, but the 70s was tough too, because we had the, um, or I should say we're tough, because we had the recession, the big recession in the 70s too. But for me, growing up as a kid, uh, smart kid, you know, got involved with sports, uh, participated in the other people's sports, pickup games music, you name it. Uh, we, so, uh, it, it was a, it was an easy t- tolerance was there. I mean, I never felt it like you said, but I swear my parents wrote this thinking, well, you know, we're, th- th- that's not going to always be like that. There's always going to be in the background and backdrop. So, and you don't see me yeah, going that- with uh, LGBT, LGBTQ bombs and N word and anything like that. I, I and tolerate, engage, educate. Uh, my parents had friends from all over the world and that was impressive too. India, China, uh, Russia, Africa. I, I, so, I like to be like that. How does it feel for you knowing, you know, what your parents went through? What's it like for you when you see all of these protests popping up all over the country at universities at, you know, uh, shut down San Francisco, you know, the, the Golden Gate Bridge. What, what do you think about all that? Well, first of all, guys, not you, but guys and gals doing that, you're wasting your time. You're wasting my time. You're wasting your time. You're not, you know, I, I hate to be so cynical, but bring it, bring it to the negotiations table. Don't be, don't be threatening my life and your life and people that have nothing to do with Gaza, for example, uh, just because I'm Jewish or uh, somebody else is Jewish. And even worse when I see it from big superstars, you know, the superstar athletes, the musicians were seeing more and more of that. That to me is very disheartening because. Yeah. In, uh, in I, my I opinion. Great with the, with African Americans. I, I, yeah. They're, they're the wrong people to be doing. And, and LGBTQ, another one, you know, you guys, if you think Hitler hated the Jews, you guys were next. And so were the Muslims and anybody who didn't come along, anybody who, you know, so. Uh, and and that's, <laughs> the, that's the, 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 the real, for a lack of a better term, that's the bitch of it for me is so all the without getting too salacious these people that are protest protesting at the colleges and stuff like that they wouldn't last 10 minutes inside of gaza they would be Correct. they'd walk inside the gates and they'd be hung as soon as they got there absolutely. you know so absolutely. and not only hung but they'd be tore limb from limb and they'd make a very public spectacle of it because you just can't live like that there and <laughs> it's it's the law and it's it's gross and it's you should be able to, you should be allowed to be whoever you want to be and in these protests how i felt was it would be okay if both sides were represented but both sides were not represented and, and you saw all the news footage of the protests and they were tearing tearing things up and demanding this that and the other thing and you'd talk to them and ask why are you here and they didn't know, Rob. They no, didn't they know why know. they were there. No, and just the whole idea of it is, I'm sure my mom and dad are, are turning over in their grave. They they can't stand it, and neither can I. Um, it, you know, you don't have a right to threaten my life. You don't have a right to, and, you know, people that call for the death of the United States and the death of Israel, to me, that just, I'm, it doesn't sit well with me. And fortunately, 98, 99% of us, I think, kind of feel the same way. Uh, is that is not a call for genocide, by the way? It, when you say yeah, death, well, when, yeah. when they say death to Israel, death to the United States, yes, that's a yeah. call for genocide, is it it's not? It's clear. No, it's clear. The And God forbid there's going to be a time when more weapons are used, more, it's not going to be just threats. There's going to be attacks. And there have been, okay, you know, intermittent. A uh, uh, couple that really got me was that 65 year old man in LA got attacked and killed uh, soon after the October 7th. Uh, a president, a uh, Jewish president of her synagogue in Detroit. Uh, was stabbed to death in her home. I'm not sure if that was related to October 7th, but uh, yeah, again, the fuel was uh, the fire was fueled. And uh, I'm not big into the sheep, the sheep mentality, this herd mentality that people get. I mean, are they bored? Are they not educated? 
So education is the big word. My What I really want to do, and, and I'm doing it with podcasts like this, and I'm doing book talks, book presentations, uh, going back to the Holocaust Museum in D.C. for the second time this weekend. I'm proud and, and privileged to say. And uh, that's wonder, it's a wonderful experience, educating the children, educating the kids, and educating parents, too, people that don't know about. Uh, I didn't know much about Hungary's history until I worked on my dad, you know, did the research and worked on my dad's book. So uh, it's one corner of it. There's pe- books from Lithuania and Ukraine and Poland and all these other countries that got hit. And I'm um, talking about that's World War II. But even in the communist regime with all the Eastern European bloc, uh, it wasn't that much better for the Jewish people. So uh, and now it, and the United States still enjoys its freedoms. And part of the reason I wrote this book is that uh, I don't know how I could have survived what my dad went through. And I don't know how most Americans, uh, like, I mean, short of military duty or uh, first responders or people that have uh, that were uh, that are highly disciplined. Uh, I, I don't know how people could could survive. Even then, you're, you're prone to uh, to that kind of thing. So that was what's so impressive about the book, too, mm-hmm. and uh, how lucky we are in this country to have it. And don't let it go because it can go in a heartbeat. And what happened to my dad? Uh, could happen to any one of us. Uh, a bad business deal, a bad neighbor, a bad uh, local government, bad federal government, a bad foreign government, natural disaster. Uh, and, you know, next thing you know, you're homeless, you're on the run, you don't know where your next meal is going to be, uh, that kind of thing. And my dad had plenty of that. So, uh, and I felt it. And people that read the book feel it. They put themselves, it's more than just empathizing. They put myself in my, and they put themselves in my dad's shoes and and race along with him. And that's probably, that's probably one of the greatest things about the book is, is, and now I don't get me wrong. I haven't read, I haven't gotten a chance to read the book yet. Um, but that's probably one of the, the best things about it is the experience is the experiences and stories in the book. You know, that these things happened and that it does go back to education and, and reminding folks that things like this absolutely did happen. And, and, you know, Rob, we I go on YouTube to watch uh, World War II documentaries and documentaries on the Holocaust. Everything's blurred out. All the uh, but people need to see that stuff. People need to understand that that happened. And if we don't recognize that it's it, it happened, it can and it will happen again. Yes, I mean, hopefully, never as and as a large scale. Uh, as what has happened. Uh, by the way, World War II, 50 million people died, not just 6 million Jews, 50 million people. So that's, uh, if that relative to the world's population, that, that's huge. Uh, so that's a good point. Um, but even one death is too much. You know, for me, uh, being a radiologist, like I said, we we love, I'm trying to preserve life. I'm trying to make diagnoses to keep people healthy, cured, uh, out of a box, as we say. Uh, and, and, the, and this is the opposite. I, I can't understand where people come with, up with this hate. I can't understand where they come up with a torture. And, you know, that's another thing that's uh, the difference between my book and now is minuscule because it's still the same concept. But what's disturbing is how people find different ways to torture other people, to maim, to kill, to to uh, to deface them. It's just whatever it was 50, 60, 80 years ago. And now it's just it's so sad how people come up with different ways uh, to uh and one thing that brings up uh, 9-11. Let's talk about 9-11 real quick, because these people are denying the Holocaust. A lot of them denying 9-11. A lot of them weren't even born yet, born in, and, and they're, they're denying it. They're not they're not getting taught proper history. And when they do that, I have to remind them that those were American targets. Those weren't Jewish targets. Um, Jews were killed, Christians, Muslims, Asians, uh, first responders, uh, never mind the cost, the collateral damage of 9-11. And uh, that's about the last time that we had uh, this cohesive uh, pro-American uh, togetherness that we, that our country experienced World War II. And, was and one. What did we do then, Rob? <laughs> we went we went to Afghanistan right after that, and uh, Israel is having a hard time defending itself right now in the political sphere. Um, if it was me, if if I was in charge, they'd get what they need. They, you know, we, we would help them, you know, and like, well, let's try to preserve life here. Let's try to get this done with as little loss of life as possible. But instead it's a political circle jerk and every, you know, people are dying. People are dying while we sit and talk about politics here in the United States. And, 
you know, I, I'm, I don't know what to think of the politics inside Israel, inside Gaza. I just know people are dying. And I know that what happened on October 7th is inexcusable. There's no there. And if you don't retaliate, they just come back. Yeah, there's no I mean, there's there smell blood. You smell blood and, uh, and some people are, are just vicious that way. Yeah, I'm not real political myself. I agree. You know, BB. He, uh, Netanyahu, he's uh, very controversial. I think he generally wants to, to defend his own country. And, and that's what, it, you know, whether he's in office or not. And he's not the only one. I think Golda Meir loved the country and Moshe Dayan, and the list goes on and on. People, uh, it's a it's a very short, the history of Israel is short. I mean, not that area, of course, that's long, way back into the to the Bible in the Old Testament. But the, you know, Israel as an independent country was not till 1948, fully supported by America, of course. And and uh, it, it is a tough time. I mean, it's like asking uh, why the United States didn't help Hungary during the Hungarian Revolution versus the Russians. If it was a two week war. Not a lot of people know about it. Three thousand people died in just two weeks. Countless refugees, countless uh, injuries uh, and you know misplaced people. Uh, a total mess. Uh, but yeah, first of all, the we didn't have all the information, probably because we didn't have cell phones and and like, big communication satellites and everything. So uh, we were in the middle of the. The Cold War, and of course, there was the nuclear, the nuclear threat in the background. So it, it would be that was always uh, the deterrent. Um, but uh, fortunately, the war was only two weeks. Unfortunately, it made the communists even more hardline, and uh, and not just in Hungary, but the other uh, neighboring countries as well. So, um, yeah, those this, those decisions are hard. I, I wouldn't want to be a politician now. I wouldn't want to be in the middle of that. Uh, this this race now, it's. Uh, and it's not just the presidency. I, I mean, I, I've reached out to my local congressman, who's a Jewish guy, a couple times. Like, what are you just asking him? What are you doing about anti-Semitism? You know, I'd, I'd be willing to do a book presentation and, and talk a little bit about it, and maybe do it as a half a day series uh, in our county here. And uh, the guy doesn't answer. He doesn't. He runs for office. He's rerunning to get reelected, but I, I'm not going to vote for him because, you know, I'm a doctor and I've contributed to society. And I think I'm doing even more so now. I mean, I've been a radiologist for 36 years, uh, helping to preserve life. And now I'm trying to do something that's probably even more important. And uh, and if nobody's going to listen, and he's not the only one, you know, you reach out to synagogues and JCCs and museums. Some have time for you, some don't. And, you know, some it's a money, it's a budgetary thing, construction, whatever, new librarian, everybody's got these make time, you know, I, I make time. Somebody invites me, I say yes. I don't say no to anybody. If you invited me to go live in Kansas City, I'd get on a flight uh, planned. Uh, Alaska, it doesn't matter, you know. So uh, I, I wish, and of course, every you can't take that personally too, because uh, there are great, a lot of great speakers or a lot of great authors or a lot of, a lot of great content for a lot of places. So I, I may be low on the list, but uh, don't ghost me. Don't ignore me. If, you, if it's a no, it's a no. Uh, but please, uh, at least consider what we're talking about here to consider that. Uh, and uh, we, eventually the book will be caught, taught in schools. I, I got invited to University of South uh, Carolina for next spring. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's awesome. I, I it's, uh, it's awesome. I mean, and hopefully it's a it's a I, icebreaker. I'm supposed to go to Houston for their Holocaust Museum. We had to postpone that, but we'll revisit it that. And I'm going to Long Island next spring for a, a book presentation there. And I've, like I said, I've got my uh, my book signing come up at the Holocaust Museum in D.C. this weekend, my second one. Such an honor. It's the, it's the pinnacle of what we do. And uh, it's a great experience talking to the kids and families. It's There's nothing like it. I could do that every day. Absolutely. So you had mentioned <coughs> nuclear weapons, and which is very interesting <laughs> because that's another thing that people have forgotten about. People have forgotten about the destructive <clears throat> power of nuclear weapons. And, uh, the well, you know, Rob, we didn't even need nuclear weapons when we in, invented them. Then we just did it before somebody else did. And uh, now we're hearing uh, nuclear rhetoric all over, you know, Europe and and in specifically Ukraine and Russia. But I think people have forgotten about the the power of nuclear weapons so much so that they're willing to say, you know, they're using rhetoric like that. They're willing to use rhetoric like that. And I, I think I think it was Eric Weinstein who said, maybe we should start having above ground tests again so people would see the destructive nature and, and the power of those weapons. 
and maybe people wouldn't use those words anymore. And I, I think the same thing about anti-Semitism. If they saw, you know, if they saw the documentaries, if they read the books, they wouldn't say stuff like that. They wouldn't do things like that. You know, one of the one of the things that I heard recently, and it was it was within the last year, that uh, Jewish people owned all the banks. Well, wow, number that's one, that's not true. Number that's two, awful. even if it's even if it was true, do you? I mean, just stop using banks if that's what you're against. It's not. It you know we don't need to talk horrible about people because they. They they're living their lives just like we are. We can have an opportunity to do the things that they are doing, and when we don't, we just sit around and whine about it, and and you know ostracize people to the point where we use in hate and anti-Semitism, and 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 just not even thinking about it before we say it, and that spreads ideas. That spreads, you know, uh, uh, somebody saying over here, the you know Jewish people own all the banks. And this person over here saying, well, you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And and those ideas come together and it just rots. It really does. And it, it, it sets apart that this chain of, of it's okay to say these things. And then it just gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse until finally you have a crazy man standing at a pulpit calling for a Jewish solution. You know, that's how these things get, we talk about, uh, uh, um, we talk negatively and almost talk this stuff into existence, you know, and th that is why I wanted to talk to you and, and talk about anti-Semitism, talk about your book, because I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm almost, so that part of history is very important to me. I'm not. I'm not very educated on it, but I seek out information and it's very, it's very hard for me to understand, you know, cause it is very interesting. It's very hard for me to understand why other people don't seek out information about this stuff, especially with what's going on. Uh, I agree. So, I mean, well, if, when, if, and when you read my book, you will know a lot more about anti-Semitism and the history of Hungary in the, uh, early to mid 20th century. And, and it wasn't pretty, there was no sugar coating in this book at all. So that's uh, hopefully that helps you. And maybe you'll, you'll read one or two more and the same with uh, the schools, uh, not necessarily for eighth grade or high school. Cause it's 400 page book. I mean, it could be summer reading, but definitely for colleges and, uh, and yeshivas and, and uh, so Holocaust uh, and uh, history, certain classes, certain they're out there. So there's plenty to plenty of places to teach uh, and, but yeah, uh, re education begins at home. And you, you, even when we graduate high school and college and med school, education is a lifelong thing. So it's time for people to relearn uh, what to do to stop fighting hate. And uh, you don't have to be Jewish to know, because what do you want to see? Uh, like they had the Nazi tanks going through uh, uh, all of Europe, uh, the Nazi tanks and trucks and, and, and soldiers marching. How would people like to see that with Hamas, you know, with those, those horrible colors and the red arrow? And uh, then people would think twice about. Well, uh, we're kind of seeing it in Ukraine. I, I don't are, know. If you, you know Ukraine, the, the Z right symbol. Up, yeah, Ukraine. I mean, it reminds me of the Hungarian Revolution. I call it the Hungarian Revolution on steroids now because it's been two years and it's ongoing. And uh, this is what war does. It's just uh, endless destruction and, and sad. And at the beginning, Putin was saying something about uh, anti-Semitism in Ukraine. And, and I'm like, what are the communists? What are the, Putin may claim he's not communist, but the, the, the regime there still smells of communism to me. Yeah, these, uh, you know, you know, unilateral unanimous elections, the, this kind of thing. Um, but to address, uh, so Ukraine is another disaster, but it reminds me of the Hungarian revolution against the communists. They lost, it was quick. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the war wasn't going to last too much longer anyway, but it ended badly with the hard line and the closing the, closing the, if they're if things are so great in North Korea or Iran or or these hardline communist countries, why are people trying to leave? Why do they have to lock the gates up? You know, why do they have to? We've got our gates wide open. Uh, it's like a sieve. It's like a flowing stream around here, and because everybody wants to be here. But so why would why do I have to keep people prison in my own country? You know, and then North Korea is a classic. Yeah, China is the worst offender right now, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, North North Korea is pretty bad, but uh, they're they're used to it there. And things in China have just changed considerably in the last 20 years that they're they've learned a lot 
from North Korea. So and and I absolutely agree with you. Russia says they're not communist and and they're kind of not because like so they use capitalism, they use a capitalism system. They don't they don't it's oligarchies and all that stuff, but they try to replicate what we did here and and still have that state control and it, it kind of worked but it really didn't. Well, capitalism, I mean inter inter uh, the country trades be trade between countries is still in a capitalist way. If we trade with China, it's not done. It's sort of done the world's way. Not uh, uh, to, the trade is is more of a of a capitalist uh, type system. Right. Uh, free trade and and all of that is another. It's a discussion for the uh, upcoming uh, election too. But uh, we'll see about that. I mean, that's we've been taking advantage for many years. But you know, if we uh, started at tariffs, bring a tax, and this and that, I, I'm not going to get all the details because I don't know all the numbers. But I do want to say that you. When you mentioned that the Jews run all the uh, the banks, so I'm thinking about that, and and whenever I hear that, I think, well, the richest people in this country, the richest people in this world, are not Jewish. Carlos Slim, the telephonist to Mexico. I'm going to start with him from from Mexico. And by the way, they just elected a Jewish president, uh, a female. Uh, I can't I can't remember her name, but we'll see what happens there. I, let's see. I mean, let's see how friendly the United States is there, and vice versa. But Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, Elon Musk. Uh, Elon now, Musk is actually the richest person in the world on paper. Bezos. Well, yeah, that changes every day with the stock price, of course. But Bezos is another one. Uh, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying. So, uh, but yeah, Jewish people have helped. You know, Alan Greenspan, and and they've been with the Federal Reserve. They've been there's been quite a few. Uh, maybe they're just smart people who have studied economics all their lives. Uh, they're honest. Uh, you know, they they don't just slide in. They're either elected or or nominated. These these people. And how's our country's finances? I mean, I, I agree that our our uh, national debt is out of control, and I'm not sure that's any that's not the federal. Uh, I don't think that's the uh, Fed's fault. I think uh, politicians more the, the endless spending uh, another another topic. But and the Fed's economy, the Fed keeps having to fix that every four by years. Spending more. No, I see, and I feel bad for the kids and the grandkids and what they might have to deal with because uh, inflation has been rampant the last couple of years for all of us. I mean, that I, I, it's overwhelming to me. Uh, I don't know how people can afford to live, but um, no, no, I don't like those stereotypes. Though it's not it's not fair to the Jewish people. Um, most uh, professional athletes aren't Jewish. There's a handful uh, in the, in the professional sports. Those people are making lots of money. The movies, and they, they, but movies. they don't advertise that they're Jewish, Rob. That's they another no, thing. They don't. No, of course not. And uh, and but I'm just saying, everybody's entitled to make a good living in this country. That's what we're made out of. Whether it's being a, a DJ, a, a host on a radio show, a doctor, a lawyer, professional athlete, a writer, whatever. We're entitled to uh, to try to to help this country, help ourselves and our family. And I think most people are in that camp where uh, they're more to, to God and, and just having a nice home and occasional vacation and maybe a couple of kids and and just a life that's uh, that we can, because life is so short and fleeting anyway. Why do we have to waste our time with all these, these protests and uh, and then that's what I would say is uh, that that we don't stereotype. It's just not. It's not. Uh, we don't all have you know the big nose thing or being uh, being. Uh, yeah, I'm not Jewish. I got a huge nose. Not spending. Yeah, I mean, come on. You've been in one fist fight. Your nose is going to be big. You're a hockey player. Your nose is going to be big. So uh, no, but I mean, don't don't stereotype. I don't think that's uh, your. It, it just it just builds uh, animosity that doesn't need to be done. And uh, I guys, absolutely you, agree. Oh, by the way, so, so my dad became an OBGYN and delivered 10,000 babies in the Detroit area. So I'm going to just throw that out at you. That's wow. called reduction. You know, his parents were killed at Auschwitz. So there's those are the grandparents I never met. And uh, while he was away at a forced labor camp, slave labor camp, right? So death and destruction all around. He was isolated because he was young and useful. So they did these arduous tasks uh, out in the middle of nowhere. But yeah, my but my my that's redemption is a you know it's not going to bring back your parents or your family. Uh, my dad's father was a dentist. Dad was an OBGYN. And he had to redo his residency in Boston. Uh, pretty impressive. He did it at the Beth Israel. It's a Harvard affiliate. Somebody who can barely speak English. You know, it's unbelievable. And my mom's uh, ra my mom's grandfather, a rabbi, was also killed at Auschwitz. So, you know, real threats to society. A rabbi, a dentist. Uh, my dad's father, by the way, was uh, he was a captain on a World War on a on a Red Cross. I like how you World said War. that a real threat to society. A real threat I, to society. And, I love know, that. Got generations of doctors. If I had natural kids, uh, they might be a doctor. They might not. But uh, I would definitely encourage them to consider medicine and science because it's such a beautiful field. There's so much to it. 
but uh, the destruction of such is not. And uh, that's what we're here fighting. I mean, in my own little corner, I'm no MLK. This is a great point too. I'm no MLK or Gandhi or Moses, but people should be reading their work. People should be looking at what they've done and what they do. Uh, because uh, unfortunately for all of them, the, their word uh, was li was uh, listened to, uh, was uh, heeded uh, in some cases too late, um, you know, murdered or assassinated or whatever. Uh, Jesus too. I mean, Jesus had the message of peace. See? So many, many heroes and, and we're, I don't know, this P. Diddy thing, this crap that's come lately. And I was watching TikTok and Instagram and all the nonsense that's there. And, uh, you know, I'm competing with that because uh, people rather see bouncing boobs than read books. And, you know, maybe myself included, I hate to say that, but uh, it, it is what it is. So, uh, and it is tough to sell books that way too, because uh, there's so many types of books, so many genres and so many forms of entertainment that uh, it's hard to sell. But uh, we one at a time, one person, one podcast, uh, one person, and one podcast, one beer, right? I mean, that's right. That's right. So we're not talking about, we're not talking about stamping out people's voices here. We're not talking about, you know, quieting people down and not letting them have an opinion. We're talking about education and uh, not a real enemy, you know, talking about anti-Semitism, talking like good ideas, combat bad ideas. And for me, I'm not religious in any way, really. Um, I am a Christian. I went to church when I was younger and I got my own opinions of organized religion. And uh, so I don't, I, I'm not really religious, but I am very spiritual. But if I had a religion, I could almost say it's the constitution of the United States. Um, and freedom of speech is a big one for me. Um, I'm almost a free speech absolutist, if you will. I'm not quite there, but I'm almost. Um, I, I really do believe the only way to combat bad ideas is with good ones. And if you run around and you start silencing all the bad ideas, that just makes them more prevalent. That gives them more fuel. So how we have to combat bad ideas is is through dialogue like this and, and educating people on things that... Uh, things that they don't ordinarily think about every day. Like, you know, okay, I say this over here and instead of silencing me, we should have a dialogue. We should talk about it that way. You know, we and not, not make it personal, you know, like, Oh, you're, you're so dumb because you believe this. No, it's not that let's, let's just open dialogue. Let's start it up. We don't have to yell at each other. We don't have to talk mean to each other. Let's just have a discussion is, in, in your opinion, do you think that opening up free speech is helpful to your cause or harmful? Well, that's tough to know because I think most people are still, I, I hate to use the word normal because who's to say what's normal, but um, it, it is tough to say. But, that's, you know, people are entitled to free speech. People are entitled to, to their opinion. I, I, people want to be in Gaza. They should go to Gaza. I mean, and, and they can run for politics there. You know, because that there's going to be a lot of work to do with rebuilding and schools and hospitals, and I can't even imagine. And I, that's wrong too. The you know, the the killing. I mean, it's hard. I mean, and but you, if you're defending your own country, it happens. If, if this happened, if what happened in Gaza happened in the United States, you you can be damn sure we'd be retaliating. We'd be we'd be all over the police, the the military. Uh, and yeah, we, you talk, we'd you have a GI on every corner. Yeah, well, that's actually Israel. When I was there, I, like I never felt safer when I was there. And even after the October 7th, I mean, short of being in Gaza, I wouldn't feel safer. I, there's so many that there, there is a lot more military presence uh, in the streets and and a lot of its kids. But I, I, I feel safer with that, too. But um, no, it, it's gotten carried away. This the the, the speech and the hateful speech is just to me. I, I, that's where I got to disagree with you is uh, the hateful speech. And I think you're on the same page with me is that uh, if it's going to call for people's uh, people to be injured or or killed, or misplaced or persecuted, then I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's right. Uh, do it in another country if you want. Do it under the wrong leadership if you want. But it always ends badly for these uh, for these awful leaders. It's going to end badly for this for the um, uh, the Iranian leaders, and it's going to it ended badly for we can go on and on. Castro and uh, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, uh, and it's always so. It's the opposite of the Moses and Gandhi. You know, it's always one guy that ruins it for everybody. Uh, but they just happen to be 
they just happen to uh, have charisma, you know, like Hitler did. They happen to have this populism. So, uh, I, you know, and I, you talk about charisma. I don't, I don't, I've listened to those speeches and, and, and it's, it's insanity, brother. I don't, I don't know any other way to put it. I, listening to that, even, even take and trying to take myself back there to that time and how different it was, it still sounds insane to me it yeah, really does people are, people are scared for their lives you know they if if you're going to be it's if they, they got a gun to your back and uh that's uh it's tough i mean people are scared if people were afraid to help the jewish people during world war ii for example but many still did you know and some were even anti-semitic and unwittingly helped my mom and dad which is that's a couple of stories like that that uh that go on and, and my dad believe me he wanted to argue that's very interesting are those stories in the book Yes, yes, there's uh, quite a few. Um, <clears throat> my dad wanted to argue with uh, some of these people, like the people, the the soldiers that greeted them when they finally made it to Austria. Uh, they were talking about Hitler, and uh, they were drinking too much, and there were anti-Semitic remarks. And the uh, the vigilante, the uh, the vigilante, the renegade that uh, helped them cross through the farms in the winter, crawling and, and muddy, and uh, Russian planes over them. He was uh, he he had anti-Semitic quips. Uh, my dad's barber once, uh, my dad's doctor once, my dad saw a doctor for a foot infection. And uh, this was soon before his first escape. And his first escape was running in the foothills in the mountains with a bad foot and with a foot. And he had to walk to the hospital and walk back with a bad foot, a foot infection. And the doctor says to him, it doesn't matter if I treat your foot or not anyway, because you're, you're going to be or you're going to be dead soon anyway, that, that kind of thing. So imagine that. Can you imagine your doctor talking to you like that? And this is in a hospital that's otherwise... Uh, uh, I'm not, it's not sanitary, you know, just, uh, disgusting, but it is what it is. And of course they didn't really have antibiotics back then. Uh, penicillin was on its way. Uh, now we've got, we got a bunch. So, um, no, so that it's in the backdrop for, for a long period, but a lot of kindness too, in the book too, a lot of people that helped uh, my mom and dad, and, and they were just returning kindness to a family that was kind and a family that contributed to society. And that's what I want us all to do. So, I, I agree. Very about interesting. Yeah, you said spiritual, and I'm sorry you're about to spiritual. Oh, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. I pray every Saturday. I fast on Yom Kippur. I I follow Passover. Uh, I'm pretty good about uh, some things, not great about others. I don't have the dedication that say my cousins do in in Israel and in Toronto, but uh, but my book is uh, honor thy father and thy mother uh, magnified a thousand times. So this is my way of at least giving something back. Uh, to the Jewish religion and and helping us fight for our own freedom, fight for our own uh, our own namesake. I, I don't know what the word is, but uh, fight for our just our, our reputation. So this is a part of that, and that, this is my uh, and hopefully it makes up. Hopefully the good Lord saves me uh, because I haven't been the best. Uh, you know I don't keep kosher that kind of thing, and and most Americans I don't think I, I think a little religion would be good in people's lives too. And maybe as and we get older, we we I think as we look towards death more we tend to get more religious i know that kind of happened with my mom and her boyfriend after my dad passed away you know um and I, and that's it's sad that we, we have to wait that long because of people uh, but i love seeing religious people around here in southern florida they go to church they're all dressed up uh i said well where have you been you look nice oh i was just in church you know and uh, afternoon sessions evenings it's great i it it humbles people you know they it, it's motivating and so uh, religion, uh, it never really hurts. I mean, unless it's calling for jihad. I mean, that's obviously an exception, but the religion and the part of it, uh, I have a lot of Muslim friends too, by the way, you know, Asian friends, Muslim, Christian, I have more Christian friends than Jewish and they're cool. I mean, they're, they, they don't think like these extremists say they, they just, we're don't. all just people, man. We're all just people. And that's, that's, that's the thing, right? We're, it's our differences that make us the same. The DNA is very close, uh, not only with each other, but with other species as well. So it's not like we're not that that different. We got seven billion people. This planet's getting crowded. I mean, that's there's no doubt about it. It's for food, water, uh, shelter, and you know, real estate. We're running out of uh, we're running out of real estate for so that that doesn't help. I think, uh, the, and you know, I'm not a big population control guy, but poverty. I think uh, I think poverty feeds in desperation. Definitely can feed into hate. <laughs> I think that's what uh, Hitler used in the in the 30s into the 40s because we had the Great uh, Depression and people were were destitute and and uh, looking for food and uh, I think he used that as a ploy to uh, 
to build up the military machine. And of course, wars make money and this and that. And unfortunately, yeah, because it was like right after World War One, like the stock market crash. It's like nineteen twenty. Yep, twenty nine. Like twenty nine, nineteen twenty nine. Yep. And so that is nineteen. 18 1919 something like that that world war one happened and uh a lot of people don't know that like anti-semitism was huge back then like and and the holocaust actually started before i, I think the it was like in the 30s you know like it started in the 30s like that we didn't have the you know the final solution or anything like that but it was you know they started shooting people and and throwing them open graves like just and that's that's how we got the the Auschwitzes, Auschwitzes and and the the concentration camps is because the Nazis couldn't handle you know doing the things that they were doing and so they well let's take the uh, let's automate it let's let's take all the feeling out of it and then it's just exacerbated the issues that we already had. It became very impersonal. And you're right. That persecution did exist, you know, uh, and even for my my parents, my dad's parents, you know, you couldn't own a radio. Jewish people couldn't own a radio. You could only be out shopping limited hours. Uh, eventually, they had to wear this this ridiculous yellow stars. My dad had the ridiculous yellow armband to, to, to mark the fact that you were Jewish and ultimately shunned. Uh, then you couldn't work, you know, and you, you had limited uh, limited sources of income and became isolated. So isolation is a big thing. So uh, all these little strategies and then ultimately death technique. And once you do this, once you do this, um, I, I don't know, I'm not a serial killer like Dexter or, or uh, whoever, but uh, I think once they, they get that, that, that feeling, they, they, they become uh, impervious to it. They become desensitized uh, to, to whatever they're doing. And, and that's sad. And, and then it's just, like you said, the ball keeps rolling. Um, yeah. Persecution. And, and some people feel that we've got a little bit of this 1930s in us. Uh, hopefully there's enough normal people I still feel as long as the government and military are protecting me, the police are protecting me, my neighbors, my friends, uh, regardless of my race or religion, then then we're OK. But it's when they start turning on you, uh, all of them uh, and then your neighbors, because they don't have a choice because they're not armed and they feel like uh, they're going to be injured or imprisoned or tortured if they do help you. And uh, so hopefully we don't come to that. And in the end, that's part of my fight is just uh, make sure that we realize yeah. And it almost out. seems like it happens overnight when it does happen. Overnight. And, you know, it's a good point you said, because and we mentioned that a little bit after World War I. Horthy, the, Horthy takes over. Horthy was an admiral and the, the Jew, he wasn't, he wasn't a big, uh, the Jews didn't, uh, they were afraid of him. They, they, they thought he was anti-Semitic. There was the Red Terror, the White Terror. You needed a program to keep up with uh, whoever was in charge, whoever was leading in, the, in Hungary. But the word, the, the Red Terror alone, it just tells you, uh, you know, it's like uh, Ivan the Horrible or Ivan the Terrible. But in the from the Jewish standpoint, from the Jewish viewpoint, it was always like, well, who's going to screw me now? How, who's going to who? It, it doesn't matter who's in charge. They're not going to like me, my religion, my group. And that that's how they felt. Well, Rob, this has been a great conversation. We've covered a lot here. Um, I wanted to I, I'm going to read the book and then I want to reach back out to you. Would you be back on the show? I'm absolutely in a heartbeat. I don't say no to anything. Uh, if any of your followers, listeners, if you want to help me fight anti-Semitism, please uh, book presentation, a podcast, uh, an interview, a, a book review, anything. It, it all helps. So, um, and now the book, the name of the book again is not a real enemy. The true story of a Hungarian Jewish man's fight for freedom. You can find that on Amazon or wherever books are sold. And we're going to link a, uh, we're going to link it down in the description and, uh, is there anything else you'd like the listeners to know? Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, if you're in the D.C. area, I'll be at the Holocaust Museum doing my book signing uh, if, on Sunday, Monday, Columbus Day weekend uh, in the afternoon. So if you're in the area, stop by, say hi. We'll get you a signed book. Uh, the book has won four awards, uh, which uh, I'm not one to tap myself on the back, but uh, it means that important people realize the quality of the work and the importance of it. But if it doesn't help me, if the book it doesn't help me fight anti-Semitism, if it doesn't help change viewpoints, then what it doesn't matter. It, that so, uh, and I haven't really had a chance to appreciate that. Um, besides uh, Amazon, you know, Walmart, Tufts, you can get the book. My alma mater, the four Holocaust museums now: the D.C. one, Illinois, Zeckelman in Michigan, and Long Island. Uh, so those are, uh, and hopefully uh, more and more of those. It's a uh, so wonderful to see your book sold. Uh, I'm sure my mom and dad are pleased. 
You can find me all over social media, Rob Wolf on Facebook or Meta. It's called Robert J. Wolf MD, uh, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube channel. Uh, I've got the uh, website, robertjwolfmd.com. If you just Google Robert J. Wolf MD or not a real enemy, well, you'll, you'll find us. So uh, what, what else? Oh, 10% uh, of my author proceeds are going to the Holocaust Museum in DC. That's to help the education. That's my, that's my philanthropy for my life and, and in, perpetu in perpetuity, even posthumously, that's going to be the case, hopefully. And, and I've got the kids and the grandkids who honor that, they respect that. Uh, they've all been to the Holocaust Museum already, showing me pictures of them holding the book. And that, that's what I'm talking about. And they're not even Jewish. They're Christian kids. They're Christian people. And uh, it's wonderful. So, yeah, not a real enemy. Google that. Robert J. Wolf, MD. Please reach out. Send a send an email. Robert J. At, and, or a podcast. And uh, I'm happy to. And I'm yes. And thank you. I'm honored if you invite me back for another awesome. discussion. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Rob, it's been great. Thank you very much for coming. And Thanks, we'll Rick. see you guys next time. Bye. Thanks. Go Royals.